read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners welcome back it's been a week we had a week off at thanksgiving and we are back and we have trisha wolf and I am so fucking excited to have her with us this week. I adore her. Like, meeting her in person was one of the best treats ever. Just because she is nothing like I would have thought she would have been. I love that whenever you have dark yes. authors and stuff. Yes. And then you meet them and you're like, what the fuck? She's just like <laughs> sweet and nice and tiny. So tiny. She's so little and like just so fun and bubbly. And she writes some fucked up shit. And I yeah. love it. I love it. So it was just, it was so fun meeting her. She's awesome. She's addicted to ice cream, which is also like one of my favorite things. So we had that in common. <laughs> but I got to meet her and her husband. They came down for a book signing that we did editions. And it was just a great experience. And I asked her while she was down here to be on the podcast. And she said, yes. So we've finally gotten her on it, and she is, like, leading us right on into December. So I can't believe it's about to be December at the end of this week, wow. which is insanity. So before we get into all Trisha's good stuff and her book that she's brought us today, we're going to talk about some serial killer shit. <laughs> we saved it. So, all right. So we were we were talking a little bit before the podcast, and Mel started to say something. She was like, oh, I'll save this for the podcast. And I was like, this will fit in beautifully with Trisha Wolf's week. So... God, Tell I me what you remember. were. Start. I had so many thoughts about different things I was gonna say. Okay, so you were talking about um, grooming and making independent women. Oh, okay. So I'll, okay. Yes. So Let me s- go I'll ahead. Start kick it by off. saying this. Mm-hmm. I watched a documentary on the Mendez brothers. Do you remember them? Menendez. Yes. Okay. Yes, that was like my intro serial killer besides John Bonet. Okay, so I watched this documentary. Mm-hmm. and it's been a long time since I thought about them or heard about mm-hmm. them. Yeah. And what was interesting enough is I'm watching this, and I'm getting in this, and I'm getting through this, and I'm like, oh, my God. These boys shouldn't be in prison right now. Ooh, I like the spicy take on it. And what was so interesting is that I was sitting downstairs and – I was sitting there and I said, hey, have you ever heard of, I said, I was watching the Mendez brothers and you Mm -hmm. know what she says? What? She knows who they are. Mm -hmm. She pops off. Oh yeah. The guys that you guys, the brothers you guys sent to prison that you shouldn't have. Yep. I was like, you guys know about this? (laughs) Yeah, we know about it. She's like, it's like a TikTok trending thing. You guys all, they should have gone to jail for manslaughter, but they shouldn't still be in prison. Yeah. So that's what I had always heard was like they were being abused, brother, and that was why they killed their parents, right? Well, I believed in what the media projected towards me. And mm-hmm. essentially, even my daughter tells me this. Mm-hmm. We're saying that we're talking about it. So back then I said, I remember two rich white boys killing their parents for money. Mm-hmm. And she goes, well, back then... You believed whatever the media shot at you because it's the only thing you got. Yeah, for sure. Just yeah, like yeah. Monica Lewinsky was a whore. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I was like, oh, my God, that it was just coming at you. And when they tell you that over and over, you're like, oh, those are those boys that killed their parents. Mm-hmm. But then you start list. I'm listening to all the testimony now and mm-hmm. all the like the cousins, the aunts, the tennis coaches. And I am just like. Uh, it was so, so explain, like, were they what kind of what were they being abused by their father they were being was abused that, by the father and okay. so here it goes into the psychological thing was it a physical abuse or was it sexual abuse too? sexual abuse physical but okay. mental abuse horribly so everybody's okay. like how do you have control over at the essentially 18 years old one of them mm-hmm. was the younger one he yeah. told he tells the story mm-hmm. and i was like when they started telling the story i was like this is one of those stories where a wife snaps. Mm-hmm. Like, because he tells you, he's like, well, this all really started two weeks before we did it. And he goes back in time. Mm-hmm. And he tells the story about how he was supposed to go away to college. He was going away to live on campus. And mm-hmm. it was, and his dad told him that he has to come home for three to four nights a week. 
and he kind of panicked and had a had a panic attack because he thought he was out. Yeah, yeah. He was out, but even the jurors were like, it was really hard for us to convince men, because jurors talked on this documentary, mm-hmm. to convince the men in the room that men can be abused. Oh, my that God. They can be psycho- well, th- we're talking about 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And they were talking about how Hollywood, it was the curtain was ripped back that these dirty things were happening in these upper rich class white people's home. Mm-hmm. And the media wanted to shut it back. Everybody wanted to close it. They just wanted them to be spoiled rich boys who went nuts. Yeah. But it made me think of people are like, how does this happen? And I once mm-hmm. watched an episode of Evil Lives Here. And this guy tells the story of his father. And his father trigger warning would he killed his mom okay. the father killed his mom which he knew what he did mm-hmm. and the father would bring these women home and he would kind of keep them captive and he killed a few of them like when they tried to escape and his dad would make him help him bury the bodies and mm-hmm. his dad showed him how you could rape a girl and how you grab their arm and all this stuff and he had disgusted him or whatever but mm-hmm. when he turned 18 he enlisted Mm-hmm. And he left and he moved across the country. He said he kept in soft contact with his dad and his dad came to his wedding. His dad would hold the grandkids. And it wasn't till after his dad died that he went and told the cops what he did. And technically what he helped do, because he buried the bodies too, even though he was like 14, 15 at the time. Yeah. And he's like, I can't. I don't, I can't tell you why I did that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I never turned him in. I knew it was disgusting. I left to get away. But Mm -hmm. on some weird level, I still love him. It was a relief when he died, but I was still kind of sad. Yeah. He's like, I can't explain it to you. And Mm -hmm. I was like, that's the kind of thing that people don't realize when they hear, oh, people snap. No, people get stuck in these weird mind traps of what's wrong and reality and what Mm -hmm. you can't. It's completely crazy, but I see how anybody can get there. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was something you had talked about before where um, when we were discussing before we recorded, you were like, you mentioned something about um, an author had said something about her daughter like being manipulated. That's what kind of led into this. Grooming. Okay. So I'd seen an author say something about her 17 year old daughter is being this. She posted this on Facebook. I'm not going to say her name, okay. but she okay. publicly posted this. Okay. And said her 17 year old daughter is being groomed and she doesn't know what to do. She's convinced that she loves this guy. And when she turns 18, she's going to run off and live in his cabin and they're going to get married. Oh God. And my, I was like, Holy shit. Hmm. Where do you even start with that? I don't know. Like the logical side of my brain tells me like, well, if you, if you try to separate them, you're just going to push her closer to them. But my mom brain would be like, so we're going to move across the country but she starting now. I don't, even know if they <laughs> yeah. live, I don't even know if they live near each other. It might be all online. Oh, my God. Stop. So she says every time she breaks off their contact, they find another way. And mm-hmm. to me, what I would do, mm-hmm. but maybe I'm crazy, is 17. This is all I've got. I've got yeah. limited time. Mm-hmm. I would immediately hire a private investigator. She cannot be the first. We're going to yeah. figure out what this motherfucker's done before. Gosh, and we're going to bring it to light. That's Second, smart, Mel. That's good. Second, mm-hmm. we're getting a restraining order. Mm-hmm. I can get a restraining order for my daughter. And every time you violate that, I report your ass to the police. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get you on file for yep. restraining orders. And then I would shove my daughter into therapy twice a week. Yep. I like That's all, all of these. That's all you can do. That's all, all you right. can this do. This is great information, Mel. Somebody write it down. <laughs> because that's all you can do. Because yeah, the only thing, all like, I think it. anybody can man- manipulate it into certain situations. But mm-hmm. there's also people who are grounded and don't need a man. They're independent. They'll think things are fishy. Mm-hmm. But 
one of my first thoughts, and I don't want to be wrong in that. I don't want to say something against the author. My first thought also was, I'm not giving my daughter enough attention. Yeah. Yeah. If she's seeking it somewhere else. If she's seeking that emotional attention from somewhere else, Mm -hmm. that means she's not getting it. Yeah. Because humans by nature seek out the things they need, even if Mm -hmm. they're with a partner and there's something they want. It's not even cheating. They could go get whatever that is from a friendship, Mm -hmm. whatever these different needs are. So she's not getting that need met except through him. You've got to feel fill that need. Mm-hmm. Man, that's so tough. But no, I like all of that. And this was what I wanted to say before about, you know, raising strong, independent women that, you know, have the self-sufficiency about them is a friend of mine, her daughter is a senior and she's graduating. And I was talking to the daughter the other day and we're, we're not super close. Like our other kids are friends. So that's kind of how like we hang out. But I was talking to the oldest daughter and I said, you know, oh, you're a senior. Like what's your plans next year? And she was like, I'm going to go to the local community college, which I'm totally for. Like I went to community college. Nothing wrong with it. I was like, all right, awesome. But what surprised me because this girl's like a straight A student, like goes to the the charter school that's here like brilliant you know I was like okay and I was like so you don't want to do college or whatever and she was like I don't think I'm ready and I was like even better like if you feel like you know yourself well enough to think like I'm just not ready to take that leap I'm like good for you so she was telling me kind of what her plans are and her mom walks over and she was like oh did she tell you and I was like what and she was like while she's going to community college, I was like, well, and she's like, she's not ready to leave her boyfriend. I knew you were going to say that. And I was immediately like, worst nightmare. I just, I get so afraid. And and, and it's not because I ever had this problem, because I certainly did not about like, I mean, I didn't really date anybody until I was older out of high school. I didn't have a boyfriend at all in high school. Like, I never had a boyfriend until I think I was 19 years old, 20. I think that's when I had my first boyfriend. But, like, it it terrifies me that, like, my kids are going to get so hung up. And a boy or a person, I shouldn't say boy, but, you know, girl, boy, whatever. And they'll get so hung up on a person that they'll, de- that they'll derail what their dreams might be or their future for that. I think it could happen to anybody because I myself was with somebody when I graduated high school and I got accepted to KU Mm -hmm. and he did not. Yeah. So I went to UMKC with him instead of going out to KU, which is a way better college. Yeah. 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 And so I ended Mm -hmm. up going to a different school for him. So even I did that technically. Oh God. That makes me so scared though. I mean, obviously, your life worked out just fine, <laughs> but like you never know, you know. You know I know. I'm not super know. religious, but things shoot you in different directions, and who knows why. Well, to me, though, it's also like you know, after you have kids, you can't really say you regret having kids. Like you just don't. I mean, like, what are you gonna do? You can't go back and put them back in. Like you can't. You can't say that. So it's kind of the same thing with like it worked out for the best. Because what's your option? You know. But I just was like, oh, my God, like, that's such a big fear of mine. And I don't know how to prevent it other than being like, okay, what else do you want to do? Like, let's go travel or something, you know, so you can see the world and see that there is more that's way beyond this one little box. I don't think I think it's a might be because I don't feel like I've made Isabel necessarily who she is, but she's the same way with like she's like, I'm not getting attached to anybody. I'm not staying around. I'm going away to college. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's already in her head, but I don't think I've done anything to. Well, and you know, like I said, even me personally, I don't think that college is the answer for everybody. It was not for me. Mm -hmm. College was not the answer for me. I went to, you know, a technical school. I got a certificate for like, I got a uh, associate's degree in a trade was basically what I did. It's in communication. So it's like, I could do anything with that. But like, It's not necessarily the answer for anybody. What I do think benefits people is moving away from your town you grew up in. I think moving a while away from the town you grew up in is a, it's not only an adventure, but it's a chance to see something different and become who you want to be, you know? Mm -hmm. 
and figure out what that is. And so it's just, you know, I think that's the benefit of doing it. And I think, you know, being so young and having a boyfriend, you know, help yeah. make that decision for you is tough. It is tough. Oh. It is tough. But I love your suggestions about the private detective, the restraining order, and therapy. I love all of that. That's great advice. I mean, there's only so much you can do and you're running out of time. I would do all three of those steps in that order succinctly. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm putting that in my back pocket for later. I'm saving that shit. I would just start pulling everything out about him. I'm mm -hmm. going to figure everything out about you. No, that's so, I would have never thought, I love how your brain works because I would have never thought he's done this before. No, oh, yeah. He's done this before. You're not talking to 17. No, you've done this before. Who have you mm -hmm. done this with? Yeah. Let's figure Who's that it? out. Yeah. And That's how old easy. were there? And what did mm -hmm. you do? And I'm going to go talk to the FBI. Oh, my God. I love this. <laughs> Never getting the FBI involved. This well, is that's who would deal with something like that. The FBI yeah. would be. That's technically the grooming, oh the God, going after it. children. That's an FBI area. Mm -hmm. I love it because it would falls in with the whole sex trafficking kind of thing. Mm. So that's the FBI's job. I don't care. I don't know what I'd have to. I don't. I don't. I just. I don't even want to say. You're like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's how you're going to end your sentence. I don't know. I just wish a motherfucker would. Yeah, right? Right? Come if at I me, see, I don't know how old this guy is or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a violent, crazy person. <laughs> but I am a mother. Yeah. And I will do what I have to do. <laughs> Maybe we should delete this episode just in case. So there's not like evidence, quote unquote, evidence. <laughs> um, you know, I, so I'm reading a book right now and it kind of is reminding me, it's giving me this vibes. So I know I've talked about it before. It's the old series, This Man by Jody Ellen Mobbles. So it's a trilogy. It came out around the time Fifty Shades of Grey, Sylvia Day came out, the Bared to You trilogy. You know, all those books, well, I don't know if Bear Two is a trilogy or there's four books. Whatever it is. Fifty Shades is three books. So it came out kind of around the same time where it's three books. It's one couple, all three books. They're really long. They're super angsty and dramatic and stuff. So this came out in like 2014, maybe? Like, yeah. I mean, it's been a while. So Jody has gone back and she did kind of the E.L. James thing where she wrote the first book from the hero's per perspective. How is it? Because people didn't like the Fifty Shades of Grey from his point of view. I did not read it from his point of view. I don't believe I did. I, I went a, back and listened to all the audios in Fifty Shades, but I don't think I did. My friend play. did it. She was looking mm -hmm. forward to it, and she was like, no. This no. just isn't. It's, I don't know. It's just not. Let me tell you. Okay. I remember. I'm going to start with this. I remember reading this man in the, the trilogy I remember talking to you about this years ago and how crazy obsessed this guy was. And this was the first book that I read. And even outside of Fifty Shades of Grey, even including it, it was the first one where I was like, this hero's obsessed. This mm -hmm. is what true obsession was. That's what I felt the first time I read this book. Reading it from his perspective, he is sort of fucking fiable crazy. <laughs> and I am eating this shit up. He do you have to go through the fucking scene? insane? Do you have to go through the scene? Because I know in the very beginning he goes and bangs a bunch of people. Do you have to go through that scene? He wakes up and he has been in bed. This is before he meets her. He wakes up and he's been in bed with a couple people, and he wakes up and he's like, "This is my nightmare," because he hates himself. He hates I thought he friend. had a night with her, and then he went out. It's it. That's that. all right. So a little bit of a spoiler. So I think, and again, it's been since like 2015 since I read this book. I think it's in the third book. He goes and one of the, he gets one of the women there to whip him because he hates himself. He wants to punish himself. Okay. So this isn't what I know that one. I just heard, okay. I just remember in the first book, which is mm -hmm. part of the reason I didn't read it was he has the first night with her and he's like flips out by how much he wants her. So he mm -hmm. goes to one of the sex club and like fucks everybody and anything in between. I don't think so. 
I don't know. And then he's like, that didn't work. I'm still obsessed with her. I don't know. I haven't gotten that far yet. I'm like halfway through the first. I'm halfway through it. I don't remember that, though. I only remember that because the safety shit. And yeah, I stuff. know. I know. I'm going to go back and see now because now I'm curious. Because I don't remember that. But again, it's been a long time. But what I'm reading so far, the reason I love it is because any obsessive hero I've ever written is like a baby compared to this man. Because he's he's fucking insane. Like, he gets to the point where he wakes up and he's holding her and she's like, I need to go to the bathroom. And he's like, no, no. And she's like, I have to go to the bathroom. He's like, I can't do it. Mm-mm. <laughs> No, <laughs> like go back to sleep like that he just says no like he's just he can't stand like he when he's not touching her he's like what is she doing where is she why is she in the other room yeah. and he's like you know like he's just constantly having to touch her and to be with her and he's like she's gonna leave me uh, and this is like day two <laughs> you know it's just like he's He's just so obsessed with her, and I am here for it. Like, I'm here for the absolute ridiculousness of this book. It's ridiculous. It is so incredibly insane that he, like, looks at her, and he's like, well, that's it. I'm done. And, you know, I love the insta-love. I I love love that that aspect of it. I love it. It, but it's like, then it becomes an obsession. And then she becomes an addiction mm-hmm. where it's like the more he touches her, the more he has to touch her. And he stops drinking the day he meets her because he realizes she gives him the feeling that alcohol used to. So it's like when he was like, it would take away all the pain. The alcohol would numb him and make him, you know, mm-hmm. like not remember. But with her, he was like lucid and clear headed, but it didn't hurt anymore. And so he's yeah. like, oh, so now she's my alcohol. So he just switches from one to the other. Yeah. And so that's what she is. Like, she just becomes his next drug and he can't stop. And it's like the more he has her, the more he has to have. And it just like he has no control. And she's like, please, I just need to go to my apartment and organize some stuff. He's like, no, spend the day with me. Where are you going? What are you doing? Who are you with? Why are you, why are you putting your pants on? And he just takes her pants off and throws them away. He's like, no. She's like, I have to give my car keys to my friend. She's taking my car. He's like, no. no she'll figure it out. She'll, she'll figure, figure it, it out. out. No. no. It's just like, I, like, I want to ride a hero this fucking. That sounds just, fun. Just so far gone that he cannot think straight. That's what I, I it's, it's beautiful. Good. I'm glad you're reading it then because you write the hero point of view. I know, right? I was thinking that too. I was like, I'm going to write the best hero next time. And so we just started our, um, our Christmas book. I you just could make that one that way. I just did. Oh. <laughs> I wrote from his chapter and I was like, I'm going to make him this crazy asshole. And so like now he's like this lawyer and he's like all this stuff and he's like, he's going to be obsessed. He's going to be obsessed. I can't wait. Which actually <laughs> kind of works because this it, it's even a spoiler because there's only one chapter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess well, I have we haven't revealed. He's like even mm-hmm. pretending to be friends with her on social media or on like the internet. Yeah. And it's not yeah. like pretending to be he's catfishing her essentially. Yeah, he's but essentially he's catfishing, catfishing her, her. Yeah. as like a girl in a Facebook or in a book club group, not mm-hmm. like a romance. He pretends thing. to be a girl reading romance with her. <laughs> because he's crazy. But I actually, I want to mention one more thing that goes in with the whole stalker, or not stalker, the whole crazy mindset. Mm-hmm. I watched this Swan Steel thing. You don't know who that is? Swan Steel, there's a special on it. I can't remember if it's on Netflix or Hulu. Mm-hmm. It's on one of them. Anyways, um, she runs a cult, or that's the question. And it's like three parts or four parts. Mm-hmm. In this documentary, there's a love story in the background kind of playing out, but it's real life. It's this is real shit happening. And I'm like, no, is he going to do this? Is he going to do that? So in the back of this whole cult thing, there is this love story that kind of like makes you excited and happy. (laughs) But at the forefront is Steel, who is a cult. (laughs) It's a girl that runs the Mm -hmm. cult. Her name nice. is Steel Steel. Mm-hmm. And what's so interesting at the beginning is they think that 
she has said, and what brought a lot of attention to her was that death is a reset button. Oh, wow. And she says she's about helping people heal and not killing themselves. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, death is a reset button. And she's being, she's in trouble for technically people think that because of her, their children killed themselves. What? Because she'll say stuff like, she'll be like, I've been thinking of killing myself. And she'll say, then why haven't you? Oh my God. So she's very like abrupt, abrupt, abrupt. So it yeah, is, uh-huh. a, but um, I do want to say this disclaimer though. If something works for you, that's great. If that kind of therapeutic approach mm-hmm. is good for you, then that's great. Even if it is the cult or whatever, mm-hmm. that's your thing. But it's very aggressive. But in this documentary, she films, um, she hires a detective, an independent detective. And when I first start watching it, I think this detective is like going to be planted. Like she hired a detective. It's a real detective. It's an older lady. Okay. And she goes, I want you to investigate us. I'm hiring you to investigate us to prove to the world we're not a cult. Okay. 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 She's a narcissist. So <laughs> yeah. Go there. So it's definitely a cult. So <laughs> You watch this all unfold and it's just very interesting as they start to go through it. And then, like I said, there's a love story in the background and it is just insane. And this PI, this older lady is fucking badass. I love that. I She's like, I didn't see her coming. Like, I was like, who is this old lady? She's still got her, like her, what are the index things where you put numbers on? Oh, so yeah, like a like, Rolodex. Rolodex. Yeah. She's got a Rolodex on her desk. That's and awesome. And I'm like, what is this girl <laughs> going to do? But, like, it's a really interesting documentary. But there was one part that you learn about after. So I'm going to tell you because I found it very interesting. Mm-hmm. So she invites this production crew in to watch her. Because she wants to prove she's not a cult. She hires investigators. She lets the Hulu crew come in. Mm-hmm. And the documentary comes out and she is fucking livid. Uh-uh. This happened like a few months ago. Because it reveals, like, yeah. as it all starts to unfold. And and it's it unfolds for some of the people. Like, as it's unfolding, it's unfolding for some people inside of it. They're like. Oh, shit. Like, you can kind of catch some of their cocks of their heads when the investigator says certain things, and it's really making them think. But anyways, she was like, I don't under, this is not what I signed up for or what I wanted. I don't, I can't believe you guys portrayed me this way when you guys all loved me. And she releases all these videos of production, um, sending her a happy birthday. They're like, happy birthday, Swan. We love you. You're oh, my best. God. Stop. And so I follow this psychologist, right? Uh-huh. And he goes, and I he talked about the videos because everybody uh-huh. was like, why would they do this? Da, da, da. Uh-huh. And he goes, they did this on purpose. If you want to get the narcissist to talk, you feed them. Oh, okay. All right. And and once he said that, I was like, he's right. As the show progressed, yeah, the mm-hmm. more and more she opened, because I got to like the, the tr- more episode, trusting she got. Yeah, she, she snapped one time, like, and I like kind of uh-huh. like shook back, and I was like, oh, that's her. That's like the real her. Yes, oh, wow. that's literally yeah. what I mm-hmm. thought, and I was like, she did that on camera, mm-hmm. but now it makes sense why she did it on camera because they were. I don't even know. Is that called gaslighting? They were feeding the narcissism. Mm -hmm. They did it on purpose. They like went in there and pumped her up. Like, we love this. You're doing good. You're great. Mm -hmm. Show us so we can show the world. When really they're like, show us. We're going to show the world you're a fucking cult. Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit. That's pretty awesome, though. I never thought about it that way, which the psychologist actually was like, it's kind of really fucked up. He's like, she's this is really going to give her some. Tr- this is mentally going to really mm-hmm. mess with this woman. Yeah. She's my age. 
Oh my God. She's super pretty. And you're, what have you done with your life, Mel? You haven't, you haven't even started a cult. What's wrong with you? I'm like, I'm like, she's got all these followers. I can't even get people to listen to this t- um this podcast. <laughs> I was gonna say, is this not a cult? Is that not what we're doing here? Maybe we've messed up. Maybe we should start over. Let's start the whole podcast over from day one. Let's but do this just, a cult. It's a great documentary because people come in, like one girl comes into the cult that's part of the romance story I'm talking about. Like she comes over fully invested to do this. And you literally watch things start to unravel along with them. And it's interesting because mm. you're unraveling with some of the people inside the cult. I love that. And it's like, oh, shit. It's just, <laughs> it, was, it was way better than I thought it was going to be. This is what we need to do. We need to get Trisha Wolf to write a cult romance. Because she could write the shit out of that. Mm-hmm. Where there's like a legit cult happening, but there's also a romance involved. But there's a woman that runs a cult. Do you hear this, Trisha? We're going to need you to get on it. Thank you. Let's read about her stuff. Hold on. I'll, we'll go through. We'll talk some more on Thursday's episode. But we're going to go through Trisha. We've already talked 30 minutes. Oh, my God. I cannot believe it. All right. So um, I'll read you her uh, author bio. From an early early age, USA Today bestselling romantic thriller author Trisha Wolf. Dreamed up imaginary worlds and characters, and she was accused of talking to herself. Today, she lives in South Carolina with her family and writes full-time, using her imaginary words as an excuse to continue talking to herself. For more information on Trisha Wolf and her works, please visit com. Join her Facebook readers group for Inside Sneak Peeks and be the first to hear about new releases and sales events when you sign up for Trisha Wolf's VIP list. And all of that can be found on her website. Um, Marriage and Madness is the book you're going to hear today. Um, it ties into Marriage and Malice. It's a standalone dark mafia romance, but if you like what you're about to hear, you can get more there. Her new release is The Devil in Ruin. It's a standalone dark mafia romance featuring Dominique, er, I don't even know how to say this last name, Trisha, you're killing me. Arisado, Arisado, I think. It's a side character mentioned in Marriage, in Marriage and Malice. So you're going to hear Dominic mentioned in this book you're going to hear. And if you want more from him, you can go get his new release, which is Devil in Ruin. She happens to mention that is also her smuttiest book that she has ever written to date, which yeah. I am excited for. So Devil in Ruin, it's the smut. Go get it. Um, this week's giveaway, she's giving away um, signed copies of The Devil in Ruin with um, Dominique and his smuttiness and Marriage and Malice, the book you're about to, or the book that this one ties into, The Marriage and Madness. Um, I'll read, uh, I'm sorry, Marriage and Mayhem is the one you're going to hear today. I'm going to read um, the book bio for that one. A passionate, fiery, deleted scene from Marriage and Malice, un- un- Underworld Kings. I was born into a dark world of mafia-made men and alliances built on blood. The one escape I had was dance. I worked hard to be promoted to principal of a prestigious ballet, ballet company. Then a devil with a vendetta against my family tore my dreams away. Lucian Cross, the madman of the Irish syndicate, stole me after my first solo performance and forced my father to sign a marriage contract. Lucian plans to use this tenuous alliance to reap vengeance on my family, and I'm just his pawn. But during our phony wedding rehearsal dinner, I decided to take charge and face the monster in my life, bringing him to his knees with the only power I have to offer him, his desire for me. Only that plan backfires when my vow not to fall for the enemy is tested and I find myself craving the ruthless touch the dev- the ruthless touch of the devil himself. I love it. I love it. It's so good. I so- love to see the bad man fall. Yes, it's the best. Mm-hmm. So you're about to hear, um, I'm sorry, the book we've got for you today is Marriage and Mayhem, or Marriage and Madness, and it is part of Marriage and Malice. So there's there's a, there's a lot of things happening here, but we're going to have all the links down in the show notes because I have messed that up. I'm so sorry. But like I said, um, if you want more from this, you can go check out the Marriage of Madness that ties into Marriage of Malice, and that one's a standalone. So, and we'll have all the links and stuff in the show notes. All right, let's send them in. Let's do it. We'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. This is Marriage and Madness by Trisha Wolf, read for you by Wesley Paul. 
Chapter 1 Engagement Dinner Lucian The scent of garlic and oregano drifts from the kitchen of the old-fashioned Italian restaurant. With cozy booths, linen-covered tables, and real candlelight to set a romantic mood, this place was an easy choice to host our engagement dinner. Even if I'd rather burn it to the ground rather than be dining in this sleazy establishment, which is owned by the Carpella crime family, my future in-laws, and sworn enemies. Carlos Carpella, the don of the family, is seated at the head of the table. He's the snake. And the reason I'm the last living cross in this city of desolation. He commanded the order for his familia to systematically murder my syndicate, the Irish syndicate, and my blood over the past decade. As the last living cross, I'm not seen as a threat to the Carpella organization, which is why the Don's brother, Salvatore Carpella, the consigliere, gave his blessing and accepted my proposal to marry his only daughter, his treasured little ballerina. That, and the fact I removed his pinky finger and blackmailed him with a threat to expose his thievery to the Don, his boss, and crime families, a slight such as stealing from the hand that feeds you is considered a grave insult, and Carlos would make an example of his own blood. Green is the color of that blood, and greed runs in the veins of every crime lord and organization in this city. My jaw sets as I reach for my drink on the table, my gaze drawn to the willowy girl seated across from me, even though I'm doing everything in my power to refrain from looking at her. Just her sitting there, breathing, is enough to fire me up. Violet Carpella, my fiancé, and the current reason why my blood is boiling pushes her lasagna around a porcelain plate. Her cousin, Sira, seated next to her, is yapping about something to do with wedding arrangements, but neither one of us care for anything to do with the wedding, or this fucking dinner. My attention is directed solely on her, despite my every attempt to divert it, as I try not to think of her, sitting there, pantyless. I slip my hand into my pocket and touch the garment, feeling the wetness that still clings to the satiny fabric. It's my doing. A choice I made in the literal heat of the moment to command her to remove her panties. I kept them as a means of punishment for her, but now I'm the one suffering my mind distracted as I think about her sweet pussy exposed and wet, just waiting for me to snatch her out of that chair and take her right back to the bathroom and lift that little black dress. What do you think, Cross? The interruption comes from her other cousin, DeMarco, a capella I've already had an altercation with at one of their clubs. I should have put a bullet in him. Then I wouldn't have to listen to his bullshit now. DeMarco sneers at me. Or is dealing with the head of the Venetian mob, a woman no less, too much to handle for you? My hand balls into a fist in my pocket, clutching the panties into a tight wad, as if I can crush them out of existence and extinguish my craving for her. With more control than I feel in this moment, I reach for my scotch. I prefer bourbon, but Italians know nothing of Irish bourbon. I take a hard swallow and relish the burn. I think, I say, setting my whiskey down with purpose, making sure DeMarco catches sight of the Irish curse inked into my knuckles, that we should refrain from discussing business during this dinner. DeMarco visibly quakes with annoyance, and I smile smugly. Cross is right, Sira chimes in. This is a night of celebration. You guys can never stop talking business. DeMarco cuts a glare her way. This whole marriage is business, he says. What else is there to discuss? Next to Sira, my fiancé lowers her fork to the plate, bringing her amber eyes up to meet mine. The fire I see there ignites my blood. She's still simmering with loathing from our encounter in the restroom, and that makes me want to drag her defiant ass right back in there and finish what I started. I rub her panties between my finger and thumb, recalling the sound of her breathy little moans, 
feeling her thighs clench around my head and my erection throbs with painful awareness. Excuse me. I remove my hand from my pocket and drop my napkin as I stand from the table. Her eyes trail me as I exit the dining room and head toward the restroom. This time, however, I enter the men's room, pushing the door open without knocking. I'd throw whoever the fuck out if it wasn't vacant, but it is, and I latch the door locked behind me. Pressing my palms to the door, I close my eyes and breathe out a curse. If I don't take care of the problem, then tonight will be excruciating. Knowing she's right down the hall, only a thin wooden door preventing me from getting to her. I turn my back to the door and lower my zipper freeing the raging hard-on from the confines of my pants and boxer briefs. I remove her black panties from my pocket and run the soft material over the sensitive head of my cock. I bite out a curse at the feel of the soaked crotch, wishing like hell it was still warm from her body heat. But I make do, closing my eyes and envisioning the sight of her in the bathroom. I had turned the lock and the fear that sparked in her eyes, knowing she was alone with me, seeing the rage brimming in my eyes, fueled my steps to her. She had too much to drink, and thought openly flirting with the bodyguard I'd put in charge of her would prove something to me. What, I'm not sure. That she won't be controlled? That she can make a fool of me in front of my men and her family? That lasted all of two seconds before I dragged her into the women's restroom and ordered her to take off her panties. My cock jumps at the memory of her lifting her black dress and tugging the panties down her thighs. Dancer's thighs, from years of intense ballet. Slim, flexible, delicate, but strong. I grip the thick shaft of my dick and squeeze, easing out enough pre-cum to lubricate the next pass down my cock. At the sight of her bare pussy, I couldn't stop myself. Like a starved animal, I attacked. I can still taste her on my tongue. I can still feel her puckered nipple in my mouth. Her soft skin becoming heated under my rough touch. Her lavender scent surrounds me now as I pump my cock, remembering how I pulled her leg over my shoulder and stared right at her pussy, glistening and ready, begging me to take her. Fuck. I shudder out the swear as I drag my palm over the tip of my cock, my balls goddamn aching to empty. In my mind's eye, I lap at her pussy, spreading her pretty pink lips open and flicking my tongue over her clit until she's arching her back against the counter, unable to stop herself from thrusting her hips. I could have eaten her all night, making her come over and over until she was spent and mad with need to be filled. But I wasn't there to give her satisfaction. She was being punished for her bad behavior. With the damned arranged effort of a madman, I pulled away and left her panting, breathless, unfulfilled and achy with need. Her hair wild and her breasts heaving, a blaze in her eyes meant to sear me to ash. Now, however, I changed course. In my vision, Instead of leaving her in the bathroom, I storm toward her and kiss her pouty mouth before I tear her dress away and bend her over the counter. Fuck yeah. I grab and squeeze her ass before I give it a hard smack, making her tits bounce in the mirror. The tiny sparrow tattoo above her breast taunts me, like it always does, making me crazy to peel back her layers and expose her secrets. Her eyes are on me, pleading for me to fuck her, Wild and dirty, as she bites the corner of her lip to stifle a moan. To make sure we're not interrupted, I remove her panties from my pocket and shove them into her mouth to hush her further. I hold my hand over her mouth, making sure she doesn't spit the garment out. Now open your teasing little cunt for me, I command her. I lean over her as I unzip my pants, wrap her hair around my fist, and yank her head back so I can whisper in her ear, Beg me to fuck you. With incensed eyes watching me in the mirror, she tears the panties out of her mouth and resists. Locking her thighs together, she spears me with a look of bitter resentment. But that only gets me hotter. 
I give her ass another quick slap, and she bucks against my stinging palm. I smooth the red skin, then slip my finger along her slick folds. Her head tries to dip, but I tug her hair, forcing her eyes back on me. Her mouth parts open, her breath's uneven, as she backs her pussy against my hand. I slip my finger inside her, and that's all it takes. God damn, baby. The feel of her hot, wet flesh tears the wild beast from its cage. I'm stroking my cock so damn hard my vision blacks. I squeeze my eyes closed against my raging need to release. I feel my balls draw up, and my cock grows rock hard with the need to come, and in my mind I've barely notched the head of my dick to her pussy. I imagine how tight her virgin pussy is as I push inside her, her inner walls clamping down around my cock. Oh, fuck. I can sense the hot stream rising, ready to shoot free, and I rock my hips, thrusting my cock into the pocket of my palm. A quick rap sounds at the door, yanking me out of the fantasy. A growl works its way up from the base of my throat as the moment is lost and I'm forced into reality. Annoyance tenses my shoulders. I squeeze my cock. So damn close. What? I bark. My son's got a... an emergency? Hanging my head, I turn and press my forehead to the cool wood of the door. My balls practically kick my guts, sending a painful ache through my stomach. Fuck. With the rancorous taste of defeat, I bite off a hiss through clenched teeth as I bury my throbbing erection against my pelvis and fasten my slacks. A few deep breaths to back the fury down. Then I rinse my hands quickly before swinging the door open wide. I meet the father's gaze, observing a hint of sympathy etched in his expression. He assesses me, taking in the skull inked along my neck and swallows. Sorry, man. Kids he says in way of explanation. I glance down at the little boy with a head full of messy blonde hair. It's fine, I say, as I step around them, giving them the restroom. As I head toward the dining room, every step sends a queasy burn up my esophagus. I pause a ways back from the table, my gaze targeting the girl responsible. Her waves of dark brown hair layer her bare shoulders, the thin straps of her dress tempting me on a dangerous level as they beg to be snapped. I can still feel her hair wrapped around my fist, and every cell in my body threatens to combust. Blue balls is a poor descriptor for the pain in my nuts. I slide my hand through my dark hair, inhaling a fiery breath to calm myself before I return to my seat. With a groan, I reach for my scotch and hold it up shaking the glass to get a refill. My arctic gaze travels over the girl across from me, and as if she senses my ire, her gaze lifts to meet mine, nailing me with the alluring vulnerability I glimpse there. My fiancé better pray I drink myself into a stupor and pass out tonight, or else it's going to take a sick level of control I don't possess right now to keep me away from her. Chapter 2 The Ride Home Violet Lucian Cross's very first act toward me was to send roses without the thorns shorn off to my dressing room after my debut performance as principal. Unaware of the threat, I clutched the bundle of red roses to my chest during a congratulatory speech. I still carry the faded cuts on my arms and chest from where the thorns punctured my skin a testament to his vow to cause me pain. His second act was to have his cronies kidnap me from that very dressing room, toss me in the trunk of a car, and deliver me, bound and gagged, right to his Dr. Martin booted feet. All because of his vendetta toward my family. And I've done well as a compliant captive. For the sake of protecting my father, to keep my distance from Lucian, until tonight. I can blame alcohol, or spite, 
or the fact that we're in public and I'm deviously tempted to push his buttons. But those are weak excuses I wish I could force myself to believe. Keeping my legs crossed, I'm hyper aware of the fact I'm not wearing panties. I try to pay attention to what my cousin is rambling about as I nod along, unable to discern a single word, way too aware of how Lucian's intense stare heats my skin. Flames dance where his gaze touches and drags over my chest. I recall the feel of his mouth on my breasts, his tongue flicking my nipple. I squeeze my thighs together to offset the pulsing ache that still lingers from him tasting me. He brought me right to the brink, then left me there. His punishment to me. But as I watch his hand fist on the table, I wonder if I'm the only one suffering. Violet, are you listening to me? Sira asks in a clipped tone. I take a sip of water and nod to placate her before she resumes without missing a beat. My gaze coasts to Lucian as I set the glass down and his glacier blue eyes track my movements. Like a predator stalking its prey, he's waiting for me to run, to try to escape so he can chase and pounce. The thought sends a violent tremor down to my bones, burrowing deep in my marrow. I don't want to be excited by the prospect, but I can't help the heat pooling between my thighs, craving his loss of control. I should be terrified. Lucian Cross is known as the Madman in the dark world of Mafia Men. But since the moment I was stolen from the backstage of my performance, I've had zero say and control over my life. So having even a small measure of control over the man across from me fills me with elation. I smile knowingly. His eyes narrow at my audacity. There's a challenge there in his pale gaze, daring me to push him, to give him the excuse to attack. As I lick my lips, his eyes drop to the slow path my tongue tracks across my bottom lip. Emboldened, I push my half-eaten lasagna aside and turn toward Sira. What about the bachelorette party? I ask. She blinks. Well, yeah, I assume you'll have one. No. The dark, booming command comes from Lucian. Sira throws wide eyes his way. It's tradition. I say, pitching my voice to a sweet octave. We can't flounce on tradition, Lucian. After he takes an extra long sip of whiskey, draining the tumbler, he sets it down and curls his fingers around the glass. You're not prancing around Manhattan drunk and susceptible for every hard leg in this city to try to fuck before the wedding. My face flames as embarrassment creeps over me. Prancing? Wow, what a tough guy word. I go to say more, but my cousin butts in, diverting the conversation. I assume to keep it from getting even more heated. My uncle Carlos has taken notice, and he sends my papa a concerned yet stern glare. The dutiful daughter and obedient niece is not behaving appropriately. My father widens his eyes at me, imploring me not to make a scene on his behalf. I glance at his bandaged hand where he's missing a finger, my insides twisting with guilt. I wave the waiter down and request a glass of champagne despite Lucian's furious scowl. If I'm going to behave, I'll need to drink myself into a coma. Lucian addresses the nervous waiter. She'll have water. Son of a bitch. For the rest of the dinner and dessert, I make small talk with my cousins, looking up every once in a while to resentfully watch Lucian drown his misery in scotch, which drives my hostility toward him even higher. After I've given my father a curt hug and said my goodbyes to the rest of the family, I follow Lucian out the front door of the restaurant. I study his backside, wanting to group him with every mob man in this city, but truthfully, He's nothing like the men I've seen growing up around our familia. Dressed in all black, boots, Versace suit, tie, hair. He's like a shadow creeping through desolation. 
He wears a silver skull buckle in direct contrast to his designer clothes, and tattoos cover him from knuckles to neck. I watch as he slips his arms into his stylish trench coat before he nods to the valet. Get my car. Where's Mannix? I ask boldly, and maybe stupidly, inquiring about my bodyguard. He should drive. You've had too much. I'll decide when I've had too much to drink. But by then, it will be too late for your ass, Kalen Ba. I flush angrily at his harsh use of his pet name for me, which I discovered through his house manager is old Irish for little girl. Lucian accepts the keys from the valet and tips him before he heads around the front of the black Audi. Get in, he orders. I haven't seen Mannix since Lucian sent him away and made me choose between a gun and a flower. Mannix's punishment or mine. That's what led to the bathroom incident, when, out of desperation, I hastily selected the flower from behind Lucian's back and he proceeded to haul me into the restroom and use the flower as a means of torture. My skin heats all over again at the memory, and I yank the car door open myself, ignoring the valet's attempt to help me be seated in the car. The air is tense in the small confines of the Audi. I slip my hands over my dress as I attempt to iron out the wrinkles Lucian's hand put there while gripping the fabric. It wasn't his fault, I say, referring to Mannix. I had saw Lucian watching us in the hallway near the restrooms, and something devious and spiteful came over me. All I did was lay my hand on Mannix's chest, and that set Lucian off. Mannix shouldn't be punished for what I did, I try again to sway him. Which, technically, I didn't even do any- Shut up, he all but growls. I bite the corner of my lip, anger searing my nerves. Why? I demand. Why should I shut up when your threats aren't really threatening anymore? He releases a heavy breath, his hands gripping the steering wheel. I don't want to hear your voice right now. If you don't stop talking, I'm going to be forced to put something in your mouth to shut you up. He glances my way, observing my blushed expression. Incensed, I look forward, watching the hood of the car eat the road ahead. Silence charges the air between us, and I can't take it. I fidget with the hem of my dress. Where are my panties? I peek over to see a crooked smile pull at the seam of his mouth. He digs into his slacks pocket and produces my black thong. I use them to jack off on. Wear them, he orders tossing the garment at me. I want my nut right up against my cunt. Heat flashes my face, and as I look down at the rumpled pair of panties, the heat travels lower. I pick them up with my pinky, then toss them to the floorboard. No thanks, I say, adjusting my dress to move the wetness away from my crotch. I'm not done yet. This piques his interest, and when I notice his gaze cast to my lap, I make a production of inching up my dress, letting the hem gradually slide up my thighs until it rides right below the apex of my thighs. With defiant energy buzzing in my veins, I part my legs. Since you left me in such an unsatisfied state, I guess I have to take things into my own hands. Lucian's gaze darts between my thighs and the road his expression carved in steel. As I trace my fingers over the top of my thigh, dipping lower, he clenches his jaw. A fire riots in my belly, my core pulsing with need, as I push my fingers higher and touch the wet folds of my pussy lips, letting a breathy moan fall from my mouth. Fucking hell, he swears, hands anchored to the wheel. You're asking for trouble, Kalimba. I rub my fingers over my clit, dropping down in the seat to force my dress to ride higher. I spread my legs wider so he can get a better view. He adjusts his position, pulling at his pant leg, and the sight of his erection strained against his slacks sends a deep ache into my core. 
I can't stop, I say, pushing one finger inside to hit the swollen mound of flesh, begging to be touched. It hurts. At my confession, he swallows hard, and I watch the hard knot of his Adam's apple bob. I won't let you finish yourself off. Too late, I say, between gasps of air. I use my other hand to rub my clit as I push two fingers inside my channel. Oh my God, when his eyes nail me with that blue flame, the need I see searing in their depths. I almost come undone right in this seat. I'm going to come. Oh God, Lucian. He jerks the wheel, sending the car off onto an on-ramp and momentarily thwarting my release. His mouth curls into a smile. He thinks he's won. I turn onto my side and slip a hand over his shoulder, getting as close to him as the front seat will allow. How did I taste? I ask, as I place the tips of my fingers to his lips. In the bathroom? When you have my leg draped over your shoulder? Your hot mouth sealed over my pussy? His eyes shudder for a brief moment as he lets me push my fingers into his mouth. His low growl vibrates against me, then his teeth nip my fingers. I pull away. I'm not that tempted, he says. Sit your ass down. Fine. A spike of fury ignites within me, and I fall back to my side of the car. Instead of doing as he commands, I push the button to lower the back of the passenger seat. Then I flip around so that I'm on my knees and facing the back seat. A small cinder of shame gathers in the pit of my stomach, but I push past it. He doesn't get to make me feel that way. Sliding the thin straps of my dress down my shoulders, I let the bodice plunge below my breasts. Then I press my chest to the back of the seat, kicking my ass out and giving my nipples the desired friction as I grind into my hand. I hear Lucian's sharp intake of air as my dress rides up to expose my ass. Fueled by my desire to make him suffer, I undulate my hips as my fingers seek the swollen bundle of nerves, grasping for release. Jesus, he mutters, driving his hand down his face. You're going to make me wreck. I smile to myself, but soon the ache builds between my thighs, my back arching as a flame licks up my spine and all thoughts of making Lucian suffer fade away at the feel of the pending orgasm. I moan into the back of the seat, my knees on fire as I dig them into the cushion. Say something dirty, I tell Lucian, forgetting how angry I am and just needing the throb to be sated. He releases a string of expletives and I feel the car swerve. Thrown off balance, I grip the seat back, riding myself as Lucian throws the car in park. You dirty girl. He unbuckles his seatbelt in an urgent frenzy. You want me to punish that naughty cunt? He shoves his fingers into my hair and grips, wrenching my head back as his other hand goes to my ass. A ripple of fear skitters over my flesh. Just a glimpse of Lucian unrestrained sends a terrifying flutter to my heart. I stifle a moan as he squeezes my ass cheek. Then he smacks the tender flesh hard. I yelp, bucking against the sting. As he rubs away the burn, his fingers probe farther in toward my slit. He runs the coarse pads over my wet folds, heightening awareness of every erogenous zone on my body. At the feel of how soaked I am, he mutters some old Irish in a harsh tone before he yanks his hand away and drags my face toward his. Fisting my hair in a ruthless hold, he stares into my eyes. His darkened gaze flicks over my features furiously. I can't tell if he's fighting the urge to kiss me or kill me. Maybe both, I realize, as the sensation to escape thrums through me with vicious warning. This is what you want, Kalen Ba? His remark is questioning as he unfastens the button of his slacks. To drive me mad, to make me desire you until I'm forced to take you before our wedding night. I try to swallow past the constriction of my throat, 
my scalp burning where he tugs at the roots as he winds my hair around his hand. Hearing him admit he desires me does something to me, something lethal, making my body rebel against the logical part of my brain. All I've heard since the moment I was taken against my will and forced into his home was how much he loathes me, me and my family. Lucian Cross has a vendetta, and marrying me is only one devious aspect of his planned revenge against the Carpellas. But right here, right now, I'm not sure what I wanted to happen. What I intended to do once I proved this man was in as much anguish as me back at the restaurant. I haven't thought that far ahead. I just wanted to see him grovel, to bring him to his knees. He grips my jaw his mouth hovering too close to mine. I can taste the whiskey on his breath as it sears my lips. Take my cock out, he demands. He's not groveling, and he's not helplessly falling to his knees. And now I'm desperate to be free of him, too frightened of myself for what my body is pleading for. He's the enemy. Fuck you, I hear myself say. The spiteful curl of his lips sets my veins on fire, and as he reaches down to unzip his pants, I jerk away and tear free of his hold. Ignoring the pain along my skull, I slide across the seat and grab the handle, throwing the car door open. I kick out with my feet and spring free. My senses take a moment to adapt to the darkness. Where the hell did he park us, in the middle of nowhere? That thought quickens my pace as I dart across the uneven ground, my heels spiking the soft earth. I can hear cars rushing past at a distance. A few lighted lampposts dot the sky above tall, skinny pines lining the highway like a divider. He must have pulled over on the on-ramp. The farther I head into the unknown, the darker it becomes. The trees pushing closer together and blotting out the sky. But as I hear footfalls pounding the earth not far behind, I push harder, past the fire snaking down my lungs and the fear. My dress snags on foliage and underbrush. My hair tangles around my neck. My calves burn, but I'm not even close to being winded. As a ballet dancer, I've pushed my body far beyond the breaking point. I grasp at the bark of a tree as I climb over a fallen limb. And it happens quickly. I've barely slowed when arms band my waist from behind, hauling back against a hard wall of muscle. Shackled in his iron embrace, my arms locked beneath his along my chest, I scream obscenities and kick wildly, striking nothing but air. My fight is swallowed by the night. Lucian's labored breaths slice his chest, and I feel every leaden inhale as if he's pulling me inside to sate a fix. I can smell your cunt on your fingers, he says, almost a snarl. He tows me toward a gnarled tree and plants my back to the abrasive woody rind. I turn my head away, refusing to look in his eyes, but he clamps a hand to my jaw and forces my face around. His fingers dig into my skin as his eyes pitched steely gray with the sliver of moonlight, devour my struggle. His other hand is banded around my wrists, and he releases my face to drive them over my head, pinning me to the tree. You could have broken your ankle, your leg, he says, shocking the breath from my lungs. I'm wary as I search his hardened features to uncover his intent. I would think that would suit you just fine. I say, hating the slight tremble of my voice. A little injured lamb? Your captive who can't run away? He groans in affirmation, cocking his head sideways and pushing up against me to cage me against the tree. But I enjoy chasing you too much, Kalenba. He drops one of his hands to clear the unruly hair from my eye. And I say, when you stop dancing for me. Not your mind, or even your body. You belong to me. I believe him. This man, this beast, is looking at me the way he does when he commands me to dance for him. 
like I'm his meal. Like the only thing holding him back from drawing my blood is the pending wedding day, where he'll have what he ultimately wants, an alliance with my family. My body will never belong to you. I forced the words out past shaky lips, and his eyes ignite, sparked by the fear he sees there, the challenge I've issued. He draws closer, bypassing my mouth to whisper against the shell of my ear. It already does, little girl. To prove his point, he thrusts his hand between my thighs. Grasping the back of my thigh, he pulls my legs apart, shoving his knee between the seam of my legs, where he puts unwelcome pressure against my exposed clit. I swallow against the rawness in my throat, and as he winds a strand of hair around his finger, inching closer to my mouth, fire envelops me from the inside and threatens to combust. He studies every nuanced reaction, every tremble, every quivering breath. He strikes at my weakest moment, tilting my chin up and placing his mouth so close to mine, one fraction of an inch closer would seal us together. Instead, he grasps my chin between his finger and thumb, imprisoning me as his thigh grinds salaciously along my pussy. Then he shoves his thumb into my mouth. Did you think I was going to watch you fuck your pussy in my car with your dainty little fingers? Just listen to your breathy moans and take it? His question demands an answer, but I refuse to mumble a pathetic response around his thumb. Fuck, baby. Your mouth makes me want to do such vile things to you. He removes his thumb, releasing me from his hold, but only momentarily. I think I will. His hand roams my chest, his palm roving over the top swell of my breasts. Then in one violent move, he tears at the bodice and snaps the spaghetti straps, allowing him to shove my dress down to expose my breasts. Rage simmering in the depths of his eyes, he dips his head low and takes an erect nipple into his mouth, sucking me in hard. I feel the intense, tingling pull all the way down to my toes. Pressing the back of my head to the rough tree, I seal my eyes shut as the flick of his tongue does ungodly things to my sensitized nerves. As Lucian gives each breast equal attention, I shamelessly ride his thigh, needing friction to chase away the painful, debilitating ache. His teeth scrape and nip at one delicate nipple, and I turn my head and moan into my arm, the stimulation an assault to my system. Fire lashes at my skin as his hand searches beneath my dress, the feel of his coarse palms on my thigh, making my core pinch with urgent need to be filled. I balk against his thigh, unable to control the desire rioting through me. He pulls back and casts a predatory gaze down on me. He shifts his knee, sending a delicious pang deep into my core. Beg me to let you come, he says, his voice a dark threat. Beg me like a good girl. I stifle a moan as his thigh rubs my clit harder, the hollow ache within demanding to be filled. But I refuse to surrender. Not yet. Not like this. He makes an amused sound, then removes his leg, denying the pending orgasm. I'm empty and cold, and on the brink of tears, when I open my eyes to see him unfastening the skull buckle. In one swift move, he tears the leather belt free and proceeds to bring my wrists between us. Fear is a live wire streaming through me as he methodically straps the belt around my wrists then cinches them together with a purposeful tug on the belt. You're a monster, I say, my words laced with all the venom I feel at his mercy. This brings a crooked smile to his lips, and that infuriating dimple pops in his cheek. He grasps the knotted leather and hauls me forward with a hard yank. Knees in the dirt, princess. White-hot fury mixes with trepidation as I stare at him, the pit of my stomach roiling. Patience worn thin, he doesn't wait for me to comply. 
He grips the knotted belt between my wrists and drags me to my knees. He fists my hair in one hand to hold me in place as he removes his cock from the confines of his slacks with the other. I watch, transfixed, as he grips the engorged, vein-covered shaft with a tight fist, making a bead of clear fluid bead at the soft head. Open your mouth, he commands. At my refusal, he notches the tip of his large cock to my lips, and the warmth startles me. I part my lips on impulse, the salty taste of pre-cum spiking my tongue. He uses my unsure moment to thrust his cock past my lips, filling the hollow of my mouth. My eyes flick upward as he threads his fingers into my hair. He hisses out past his clenched jaw. Wider, he demands. Take me all the way to the back of your throat. My knees sting as I balance on the hard-packed earth, leaves and roots biting into my skin. But I try to pull him in, moving my tongue over the head and down along the shaft because, for some fucked up reason, I want Lucian to like what I do. I want to feel powerful over him. My fingers seek the material of his slacks, gripping and clinging to his thigh as I moan around his cock. He works his hips, thrusting deeper, until my throat flexes on a gag and my eyes start to tear. That's it. Fuck yeah. He growls and digs his fingers into my hair. I want to see that pretty face streaked with mascara. Just like the night you were thrown at my feet. He's depraved. A fucking deviant. That was the worst night of my life and he's getting off on my pain. Anger rises up to embolden me and... On impulse, I pull back and snag my teeth down his hard length. He bites out a brutal curse and yanks my hair, wrenching my head back. A dark look passes across his features, as if the pain I delivered only served to arouse him further. You want to play with fire? He taunts. But he doesn't allow me to respond. He wraps my hair around his fist and drags me upward, forcing me to stand. Eyes still bleary and scalp smarting, I push against his chest with bound wrists. I'm sick of your twisted games. This isn't a game, Kalen Ba. He releases me to hitch his pants up and fastens the clasp. One moment of freedom, where I think of running, then Lucian has me in his grasp again. My little dancer likes to bite. His gaze drags over my bare skin and latches onto my shoulder. His hand brackets the back of my neck as he draws me to him. He breathes me in like a vampire scenting prey, then his mouth descends on my neck. Lucian. My protest is weak at the erotic feel of his mouth devouring my flesh. I'm tired of fighting, trying to refuse him when the whole reason we're here right now is because I was starved for his attention. I've been falling for him since day one, and I may hate myself for that, for desiring the enemy. But when he's touching me, kissing me, making me almost combust just from looking at me with the heat of those intense blue eyes, all I want to do is give in and be lost to him. As I'm losing the battle, my fingers seeking the buttons of his shirt placket. I'm pulled under by his lips, his tongue doing damage to my nervous system. I'm a live wire waiting for a connection. His mouth drops lower to my chest. He sucks the skin over my collarbone, nipping the flesh of my breast. My bated breath burns like acid in my lungs as I wait for him to either deliver pleasure or pain both equally anticipated. His teeth sink into the soft swell of flesh above my breast where the tattoo sparrow is inked into my skin. And suddenly, fear ratchets to new heights. I try to pull away, but he has me anchored in his iron grip. I wonder if I can flay this little bird from your body with my teeth, he says. Then he aims to make good on his threat as he sinks his teeth into my skin, his bite drawing blood. 
I cry out as Lucian laps at the wound like an animal, tormenting me on a diabolical level. The sparrow, a reminder of my twin brother, is all I have left of Fabian, and Lucian is marking his territory by tearing that part of my life apart. You sick bastard! I beat my bound hands against his chest. When he finally relents, he straightens to tower over me, and a hint of smeared blood stains his lips. He wipes it away with his thumb, a devious smirk playing at his mouth. You taste divine, he says. You taste like mine. And the hunger I glimpse burning in his blue flames says this taste only wet his fiendish appetite. Without warning, he swoops down and whisks me into his arms, cradling me against his hard chest. I try to elbow him, but he pulls my wrists out straight to lock my arms. I should throw you over my shoulder and spank your ass, he threatens. His degrading words heat my face. I look away, shaking my head to clear my tangled hair from my eyes. Then you no longer have to punish Mannix, I manage to say around clipped breaths. Your punishment is no longer based on your display at the restaurant. He carries me back up the incline, his arms bracketed around my body like a vice. Your teasing little cunt warrants its own special brand of punishment, and I'm going to deliver. It's not a threat. It's a promise. What will it feel like to be taken by Lucian? Can I lose my virginity to my fiancé without losing myself? My heart? I thought I could once. I wanted to make it happen so badly, to just get it over with, to end the torment, but at my own choosing. It was in that moment when I first eluded myself. After I washed the blood from his body, the blood of someone he had tortured and killed, which led a deranged madman to the dance hall of his home. He attacked me, would have strangled me if I hadn't broken through to him. Right then, in the shower, with his cock notched to the entrance of my pussy, just one thrust away from entering me, I was decided. I would offer my body in exchange for some measure of control over my life. What a delusional fantasy. How can I ever have control over this man if I can't even control my bodily response to him? But at least it will be on my own terms. Not on my wedding night, after I'm forced into an arranged marriage. If I have any say at all, it should be when and how I choose to give myself to him, not for him to take when it pleases him. That's my power alone, and as he steps toward the hood of the car, I shift in his arms so we're face to face. Breath bated, his gaze narrowed suspiciously. He looked down at me with guarded fascination as I draw my linked wrists over his head. He grips my thigh, as if the act is involuntary, a direct result of my fierce and direct approach to beguile him. A tiny flicker of courage blooms within me, and I stoke that flame as I cast my gaze at his lips, drawing myself up to him. I hold there, suspended and waiting, before he meets me the rest of the way. We collide. Our mouths crash together in a heated frenzy of craving and desperate need, lips firm and ungiving, until his mouth parts over mine. I sweep my tongue into the delicious hollow of his mouth, savoring the rare surrender of his control. I whimper into the kiss, overwhelmed with the feel of Lucian's tongue dangling with mine and demanding strokes as he tastes me, becoming adamant in the motion to claim my mouth. My heart riots in my chest, not knowing whether to beat or to stop outright, every pulse erratic in my veins as liquid fire sears my blood. At some point, my back meets the surface of the car, and Lucian presses into me with wicked need to be closer. He hoists me up against his chest as he dexterously repositions my legs around his waist. I shiver at the intimate feel of his hardness, grazing my bare pussy. 
He thrusts his confined erection against my entrance, pushing the needy ache deeper. Muscles strained, he brackets my back with strong arms. Fuck, he whispers harshly over my mouth. You're fucking killing me, Kalen Ba. The power I feel at Lucian's loss of control. It's intoxicating. Forgotten is his desire to punish, replaced with his maddening urgency to consume. His mouth goes to my neck, tongue and lips working in tandem to liquefy my insides as I meld into him. Even my resentment toward him and my whole indignant position amid the organization begins to wane as I give in to the demanding craving seizing me wholly. For one moment, one suspended heartbeat, I want to let go. Just lose myself in this man and every temptation pulling me under. Take off your pants. The words are mine, uttered with a desperate plea. He doesn't deny me. Lucian removes one arm from around my back and tears at his pants. I hear the zipper rip free, then the torturous press of his smooth cock to my pussy lips. He holds himself there, unmoving. As he pulls his head back to stare at me, I see the pain etched in his face. How badly he wants to push inside and decimate me. But leashes his urge. Restrained, Lucian reaches behind his head and grabs the knotted belt, brings my wrists from around his neck. Pressing my lower back into the unforgiving surface of the car, he moves his hand to my chest, playing over my exposed skin delicately, tracing the bite mark. Then he travels up, his fingers roving harder along my collarbone. His eyes darken in contrast to the night, as he collars his hand around my throat. A whisper of fear feathers over my nerve endings as his grip tightens. I try to capture his arm, but my wrists are bound by his belt, preventing me from escaping his hold. He pushes me down against the hood. It's still warm from the engine, conflicting with the cool night air on my skin. He removes his hand from around my neck momentarily, as he drives my bound wrists above my head, pinning me to the car. Lucian. I manage to free his name from my constricted throat before his hand seizes my neck again, locking me between the car and his body. All fear and fight evaporate at the feel of his hard shaft slipping between my folds. Heat courses a blistering path up my thighs as he continues to slip between my wet lips, he doesn't push past my entrance, maintaining an excruciatingly slow pace that drives me wild. I'm going to own this sweet pussy, he says, thrusting his cock higher, the tip hitting my clit and sending a sharp electric jolt through my core. The pressure intensifies around my throat, cutting off my airway. I'm so far gone to the promise and denial of pleasure, I'd gladly trade breath for release. Lucian slurs a heated curse as he pulls back, and I can feel how wet I am as he slides through my folds. He's warm and hard and so close. I buck my hips, physically demanding what he's refusing to give me. He removes his hands from my wrists and neck in one abrupt move, coming down over me, his body solid and heavy, the weight almost making me dizzy as I gasp air into my lungs. He buries his mouth against the crook of my neck and releases a primal growl, a violent feel of which elicits an erotic, dangerous shiver down to my bones. I'm going to fuck you, he says again, his tone menacing. I'm going to fuck this pussy until you're begging me to let you come. He drives his point home by thrusting his cock harder along my soaked entrance, but I'm not taking your virginity on the side of the fucking road. As he raises up, leaving me cold and hollow and exposed on the hood of the car, a fiery coil of anger twists within me. He's reduced me to some pathetic, needy girl not once but twice in the same night, and if he thinks... I hear the distinct snick 
of his knife as he removes the blade from its sheath along his pocket. All thoughts of unleashing misery on Lucian Cross cease the moment the shiny blade catches the gleam of moonlight and he comes at me. Out in the open, crickets chirping, the fear of passerby. His beard stubble that wounds my face as much as his lips wound my soul. Well, welcome back. Welcome back, lady listeners. So that was the first installment of Marriage and Madness by Trisha Wolf. Um, we are going to play the second installment for you on Thursday's episode. Make sure you check out the show notes to enter this week's giveaway, which is a signed paperback of The Devil and Ruin and Marriage and Malice. So I think that's it. All right. Tell them that's what's good. All right. Go fuck your day up. Make sure your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance.